Hello, I'm Elise. And I'm Katie. And welcome to This Is Our Game. 2021 has been a landmark year for women's football. Not only have we seen record broadcasting deals, but it also marks 100 years since the ban was placed on the women's game by the FA. To find out more about the ban, our reporter Nicole caught up with the curator for women's football history at the National Football Museum, Belinda Scarlett. I'm Belinda Scarlett, I'm Curator of Women's Football at the National Football Museum. So the, the Football Association ban, um, that came into place on the 5th of December 1921. Um, it was a, a group of, of men um, in the FA Council who voted for that resolution to come into place. Um, but there had been pressure on the FA for a little while to look at the issue of women's football. Um, after the war, some felt that it wasn't appropriate that women continued to play football and they wanted society to get back to normal so that meant women um, to move out of the workplace and to stop doing some of those activities that they'd started to do during the First World War and football was one of those. Um, so they thought that football wasn't suitable for women, largely around the effect that it might have on, the, on their bodies and their fertility. But there was also an issue with the way that the funds were being used from um, charitable matches. And that was raised as a, as a complaint to the Football Association. And that ban stayed in place until around 1969. Women did continue to play football. I think that's the most fascinating thing about it, is that I think it's a reinterpretation of the history of the ban. So often it's seen as... Um, almost poor women, they were banned from playing football, but the way that we like to interpret it is to focus on the, the, the agency and the actions of the women that continue to play. One thing that comes across from researching women's football, football history is how collective it is. So it's often groups of women that come together to, to play, obviously, but also just to organise women's football. Um, and I think that's a really interesting part of it. So there's women like Lily Parr, who's probably the most famous player for the Dick Kerr ladies, um, partly because of she was just a really good player, so she was in the newspapers a lot because of that. But she's sort of become a figurehead for women that were um, banned and then continued to play. In um, the 1940s, you get a lot of Manchester-based women's football teams. The Manchester Corinthians were one of those. And then in the 1960s, you get something called the Women's Football Association. They started to pull women's football together as like an organised sport again, to organise a league. You get... Um, people like Pat Gregory, who was the woman who really brought all that together as a, as a, as a secretary, but also people like Sue Lopez, who I'm, I'm sure you've heard of as real pioneers of women's football in, in the 1970s. So you get these sort of great names, but I think the emphasis is on the collective nature of women's football and how women came together to, to do it um, and not to, to be pushed to the, to the sidelines. The campaign to lift the ban actually started in 1969 and that was pressure from the Women's Football Association largely to get that ban lifted and then it just made huge leaps and bounds after that. Um, they, you can't really have a competitive football structure unless you've got a league and uh, an FA Cup um, and that's what the WFA did so they put all of that structure in place and once a group of competitive teams started playing against each other obviously the standard of the game improved massively so yeah that period was absolutely a, a key moment for the women's game. I have really positive views on where women's football is today there's a few reservations I think about its direction um, the more you look at women's football history, the more you realise how radical it was in the past. Um, and it was a, a real feminist act and there was a lot of, it was quite a politicised thing to do for some women that played football in the past. And I think that's being lost a little bit as it's becoming more of a corporate um, thing. But obviously that also brings with it money, professionalisation, better training facilities, bigger crowds. Um, I do think there's something to be said for women's football staying independent, so not necessarily always a team linked to a, ma a man's team. And there needs to be more support in place for, for independent women's football teams to make sure that they can compete with the other names in the WSL, for example, they don't get pushed out. Um, so I think as long as that, that sort of more radical um, side of women's football can stay in there, I think it's, it's got absolutely, it, it'll go far, it'll, it'll, it's got a long way to go. That was really interesting to hear from Belinda and see her thoughts on how women's football used to be. We're now joined by Nicole. Nicole, what were your main takeaway points with your talk with Belinda? So what I found really fascinating was how the FA basically just wanted to push women out of the way and make football a male-dominated sport. 
and what was most fascinating I found was their just their excuses for the ban to be put into place so one being that they said the fertility of women would lower if they played sports like football and the other one well a bit of a backstory all the money in women's football prior to the ban was for charity so you know the admission fees everything that I'm, all the money involved would go to charity but that money was being misused for personal uh, reasons and not actually going to charity so I just find these little excuses fascinating how they and why they put this ban in well you can say that that excuse isn't really justifiable solely because when the ban got put in place the women that were involved didn't stop playing so they played in parks they played in cricket fields they didn't have sponsorship they didn't have that money and 50 years down the line because of their determination and them wanting to play it didn't matter because the ban got lifted and look where we are now. So saying that the money aspect was one of the reasons why the ban had to be put in place is just not really justifiable by them, I think. Yeah. I would like to see if men's football had the same, you know, ban put in place, would they have been able to continue through? Like, I think it just shows how strong women were to actually continue playing for these 50 years like, you know, behind closed doors and everything, and to eventually push through to get the ban lifted and to be where we are today. Because I'm not sure men's football would be in the same place. I agree, I agree. And I think we need to look back at those, at those figures in football history, like um, Lily Parr, and be grateful and thankful for them for what they did. Because without them and the fight that they did put, put in, would women's football be where it is today? Would the Lionesses be where they are today? I think you saying about Lily Parr, I think her being that uh, main person mm -hmm. is obviously something that especially younger girls and people involved in football, especially women's football, look up to. But it's, it was so important that it wasn't just her. It was a community. It was everyone that played women's football. It was everyone that supported women's football. Anyone who was involved, it was important that they came together. It's the beauty of football, isn't it? You know, it's yeah. everybody coming together. and It wasn't just a one-person fight. Yeah. And I think that was so important to keep women's football going through all them years. It was a really tight community. Speaking to Belinda, she was saying that there wasn't, obviously, a lot of women did get have to go just back into work and kind of be forced out of football because yeah. of the ban. But the ones left, they actually end up being a really tight community, which led the you know the, the push for the ban to be lifted. Obviously, it took fifty years, but you know without those people, we wouldn't be where we are today, and you know we wouldn't be able to. We, girls today wouldn't be able to access football as much as they can. And I think that has led to competition such as she believes and it's given the women's football euros and world cups and just a whole world community really not only that we're looking at new broadcasting deals such as the sky sports deal yep so we spoke to some current voices within the wsl to hear their thoughts on how things have changed in the modern women's game since i started playing um yeah i've seen the women's game grow massively. I think I've been around it a long time and seen older players go through worse things than I have. Um, for me personally, I used to wear boys kit. I used to play with the boys and on pitches that had glass bottles smashed, we had to clear up before we even started playing. So yeah, and now I play in a stadium. So it's completely different, yeah. I think hearing that there was a ban for 50 years um, on women's football back then is, is frustrating because obviously the love the women had for the game was incredible and to hear that they weren't then allowed to play anywhere um, is frustrating but I think it shows as a society and as a game we've come a long way and now um, I hope they're obviously proud of where we are now. The division between the men's and women's game is, is huge at the moment and I think yeah the 50 year ban probably didn't help us. Um, we kind of had to start again and I do think they're a completely different game. Um, the money, the advertisement, the, the people have that have interest in the men's sport is, is huge and I think we're just on our way again to that kind of stage. So yeah, the 50 year ban would have delayed that, but we're trying to get back to where we should have been. For me personally, the Sky Sports deal was incredible and when it was announced everyone within within the game was, was buzzing and I think 
personally, I can see the difference because we played Man United on the first day and the cameras are there. They're all in your face. It's completely different. And obviously the fans, you know, at home are watching. The fans in the stadium are watching. Um, so it's massive pressure for us, but I think we deserve it. And I think we're going to thrive underneath it. I'm happy for people that have fought for me to be where I am. So I'm happy to see that players who have retired now have been pioneers for the game. And for me to be a pro now is, is incredible. So yeah, I'm happy for them and also happy that now I can push and reach my dream. It's difficult because obviously I'm still quite new to all of this. So I can only really talk from when I was a fan going last year to now going maybe in a more professional capacity. But when I used to go to the stadium, it wasn't even just about the amount of people there. It was about people's like understanding of the game. So when I would go in 2017, 2018 to a Man City game, for instance, to the Academy Stadium, there was obviously a lot less people, which is just a given. But actually, the people around you wouldn't be that involved in the game. But now you've got such access to these players through social media and such access to these players through the efforts made by the club and by Sky and by BBC, that it's like you're almost seeing celebrities. Like you're what you're in the, the stadium, you know, watching Chelsea versus Man City last week. And like that's Fran Kirby, like right there. And that's really cool because it kind of adds another level to it. And it also professionalizes the game, but it also ensures that the players have sort of job security and sponsorship and, and that sort of stuff that, that makes it comfortable for them to be elite athletes, that they're getting like deals and they're getting, you know, you know, deals with car companies and things like that. It really helps them to kind of be able to do what they do on a daily basis. So I think that's the biggest difference I've noticed is people's understanding of the game and the players and their involvement in the game has grown so much. Um, in terms of professionally, all I'll say is at Manchester United last season, you didn't get free sandwiches and now you get free sandwiches. So <laughs> just saying. Run up in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so we've just seen from Lily and Helen that you can go from a 50 year ban to a few thousand fans in a stadium to a WSL broadcast deal. It's kind of crazy how much it has grown because there's 104K viewers that are now watching the WSL on Sky Sports and an additional 500K viewers that are watching it on BBC Sports. It's just mad how the belief from these broadcasters has grown the game so much. We can talk about the broadcasters, but let's face it, let's look at the players, the competition on them right now. They're not just playing in front of a few fans anymore, a few, a few thousand. They are playing on live on TV. And I think that is incredible because it makes the players fight and it makes the competition that much harder every time they step out on the pitch. They want to be there. Women's football, it's never been so popular. It has never been at this stage. And we can say the competition's high. 100%. Now, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon for more stories from This Is Our Game. Bye. See you next time.